Sid E. Sharon Henry. Blessing, blessing, Samish. Good night, good night, everybody. Sister, <laughs> get your Bible out, get your pen and notebook. Let's take a walk in the world tonight. I'm not going to be as aggressive tonight. <laughs> I'm going to scale back. Genesis 15, we're reading from verse number 8. Genesis 15, reading from verse 8. Our second scripture. Genesis 20, 24. That's our second scripture. Yeah. 
Faith over fear. Good night, Monica. Careful what you say. All right. Think about what you say. Jesus. Jesus. Precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to try. Do we have any worshipers? Lift your hands and say. All right. Good night, everybody. We're getting into the word. We're talking about altars, covenants, and monitoring spirits and see how they correlate, how they are interrelated, interconnected, and what we can do as the people of God to free ourselves from covenants that we did not make, but we are suffering from the after effects of what somebody in the bloodline has done in the past, and now our fathers ate green mangoes and our teeth are set on edge. Father, bless your word tonight and grant wisdom and give revelation to the people. Open the eyes of their understanding and break them through. Give them sudden advance and victory over long-standing problems. In Jesus' mighty name, Jewel Smith, Amina Ramsarup, good night, everybody. Fate over fear. Genesis 15, reading from verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? In Genesis 12, God appeared to Abraham, and now God appears to him again, making these promises. And from all indication, from all appearances, God was taking too long. And so he was asking, when shall these things be? When are you going to do what you said? How shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, Take thee an heifer that is three years old, and a she-goat that is three years old, and a ram that is three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took him all these, and divided the meat in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. He's laying them at the altar now. And he took on to verse 11. And when the fowls came, the fowls of the air, came down upon the carcass, Abram drove them away. Don't play with my altar. Don't mess with what I'm doing here. Don't interrupt what I'm doing here. And when the sun was gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. A deep sleep fell upon Abram. Whatever is going to happen now is happening in his sleep because the principle is your, your body can be asleep, but your spirit man, the real you, alive, alert, and paying attention. And lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, God is speaking now, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be stranger in the land that is not theirs. He's talking generationally now. Notice God is talking to the man, but he's talking to him about his children. Your seed shall be slaves in a land that they don't know. He's talking about Egypt for 400 years. And they shall afflict them 400 years. There you go. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards, they shall come out with great substance. They're not going to be broke when they come out. And thou, you Abraham, shall go to thy fathers in peace when you die. Thou shall be buried in a good old age. You're not going to die young. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither. Again, 400 years after now, they will come back to this place. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. I want to deal with a nation called Amorites, but they're not ready to be dealt with yet. I'm going to use the children of Israel to deal with them, but it's going to take a while for them to get to that place 
where judgment will fall. And it shall come to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between these pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. He is at an altar. He is put down the sacrifice. He is in his sleep. He is caught up in a dream. And God is making a covenant with a sleeping man. The flesh is asleep, but the spirit is alert and awake. The real you. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between these, those pieces, the sacrifices. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. The same day the Lord made a covenant at the altar with Abraham. Unto thy seed will I give this land. He's talking to Abraham, but he's talking about Abraham's children. He don't have no children yet. And the demonic world operates with the same principle of dealing with you generationally through the bloodline. When you make a covenant, an oath, it is not you alone that's involved. Everything that comes out of you, out of your body, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, they're involved in it too, even though they're innocent and don't even know what's happened because they weren't there. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, from the river of Egypt, Unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kesizites and the Kemonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and Canaanites, the Gergeshites and the Jebusites, I'm going to give you this land. So the Lord appears to this man in his sleep and makes a covenant with him. You say, well, Rev, you know, you can't make a covenant with a sleeping man. I just read the scripture where that had just, just happened. A covenant with, was made with a man in his sleep. That is why you've got to watch your sleep and watch your dreams because covenants are made in your sleeping state because though the flesh man is asleep, the spirit man that the covenant is made with is awake and alert and paying attention and can make covenants. So here we go for tonight. We understand from Scripture, Psalms 54 and 7, Psalm 34 and 7, sorry. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him. What am I talking about? I'm saying here that God has given angels to the people that fear him that fear God, his believers, to watch them, to serve them. They are ministering spirits to us who are heirs of salvation. And they are watching us to wait to hear the word of God come out of our mouth to make it happen. So the human beings are being monitored by angelic hosts. Spirit, the spirit world of angels are monitoring you and I. They encamp round about us. Satan is a master counterfeiter. He sees God doing that. He's doing the same thing for a negative reason. In Psalm 91 verse 11 and 12, the angels are given charge over us lest we dash our foot against a stone. They have to be watching us to know when we are about to dash our foot against a stone so that they can deliver us. We are being monitored, watched by angels. Monitoring spirits are angels too. They're not just demonic powers. In Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, the Bible says these angels, these spirit beings are ministering spirits that are sent forth to minister for us who are ears of salvation. The monitoring spirits are ministering spirits, angels sent to work in our behalf. All of us have angels that guide, that protect, that bring messages to us, that come to us in our dreams, that monitor us. And serve the purposes of God in our lives. 
in Psalm 103 and verse 20. Now I know you're copying these scriptures, not just sitting there digging your teeth and twiddling your thumbs. I know you're copying these scriptures. Psalm 103 verse 20. Blessed are ye almighty God who have these mighty angels that hearken to the voice of your word. They hearken to the voice of your word. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible doesn't speak. No, it doesn't. But we are the ones that voice the word of God. We give voice to the word of God. We give voice to the Bible. We give voice to the scripture. We give voice, sorry, to the scripture. What does that mean? It means we say what we know to be in the scripture. And when things happen, instead of talking out of term and out of the biblical context, we confess what we know to be true in the scripture. We quote scripture. We don't say I'm frustrated. We say, greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. The strength of the Lord is in me. For the Bible said, let the weak say I am strong. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We say that. The angels listen to the voice of God's word and they, and, and they enable, they empower us. They strengthen us right at that point. You must understand that the opposite is true. When you voice negative, toxic words that have no, no bearing on scripture, the demonic world hear you as well, and they work to make that thing come to pass. When Laban went to Rachel and his son-in-law and said, somebody stole my gods. And he said, if you find it, let the person, whoever stole your gods, let them die. He didn't know that Rachel, the love of his life, for whom he had worked 14 years, had stolen the gods and was sitting on it. Then when her father came, she said, I'm having my monthly cycle. I don't want to get up. I'm unclean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The father didn't search there, never expecting his daughter was lying. And she was going to die in childbirth, just like her husband said, let them die. She died. The love of his life that he had labored for for 14 years, died according to his negative, toxic mouth. While the angels listen to the voice of God's word, the satanic world listen to the voice of your own words. And they work and scheme and cooperate to make that negative thing come to pass in your life. It's not Obia, it's you and your big mouth. You and your toxic mouth. You and your inability to quote scripture, you and your temper, when you vex, you talk foolishness. I'm going to just die early and leave y'all and see how y'all will make it without me. That kind of foolishness. We talk out of term all the time. And so, demons do the same thing. They carry out negative confession and they respond every time. They respond every time. You say, oh, my back is killing me. All right. Now the demons are given authorization by you to invent some sickness, disease, or calamity to kill you using your back to kill you because you have been confessing that your back is killing you, your feet are killing you, your this is killing you, and that kind of stuff. And with all you know that life and death are in the power of the tongue, you are still too lazy to be alert and to prevent yourself from talking that foolishness. You always have something toxic and negative to say about yourself. And you wonder why things are not going right with you, talking about your bad luck. You go ahead with that nonsense. Demons carry out our false confession. They respond to our negative words every time. Now the angels that are encamping round about us, they do not go to work for us unless we voice the word of God. They can't do a thing until we say the word and agree with God. A lot of people have angels. The angels have not done a thing for the last 40 years because they have not said a scripture for the last 40 years. All they're doing is talking toxic. Satan is a duplicator. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking. What does that word seeking mean? Observing, monitoring who he can devour. That brings me to Genesis Exodus, sorry, chapter 20 and verse 24. Let me read from verse 23 so we get text and context. You got that right, Shana Hudson. 
Ye shall not make me gods of silver, neither shall ye make me gods of gold. I don't want no idol, God is saying. An altar of earth you shall make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon. Anytime God wants to do something of significance in the life of any individual, he tells them to build an altar, erect an altar, and meet me there. We're going to cut a covenant. We're going to make a deal. And I will keep my word. And as long as you keep your word and serve me, I will look out for you and your children and their children and their children and their children. Once you make a covenant with me, that covenant is good for 400 years. That's the strength and length of a covenant that is made both with God and the satanic world. An altar of earth shall thou make me, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thy oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. In all places, every altar that you record my name, I will come to that place and bless you. And from that place, the blessing will follow you. What is happening there? That's God is saying, look. When you make a covenant with me at an altar, from the day you made that covenant, my spirit will go with you. You're not leaving here alone. I'm, I'm looking out for you from now. And when you get children, I'm looking out for your children. And when they get children, I am looking out for their children. And when they get children, I'm looking out for their children. I'm going to be monitoring your family to make sure that you keep the word that you say. And I will bless your children's children's children. You're not leaving here. When a covenant is made, whoever you make the covenant with, a spirit is going with you from then. In this case, the spirit of God is going with this family, with this bloodline, with this generation. From then, that point when the uh, sacrifice is made, to 400 years after. I will come unto thee. I will come to you, the human agency that's making this covenant with me, and I will bless you with the same token when you leave an altar, when you leave an Obia house, a Juju house, a Voodoo house, a native doctor, a palm reader, a sea fireman, occult involvement, and all these people, black magic and all that stuff. A spirit leaves with you. You don't see it, but it's there with you. And you're going to see the effects of it from that very week. You start to have funny dreams. Things start to move around in the house. You start to get sick. Somebody break out with some disease. And from then the family always has a disease. And that spirit is now monitoring the family. And your children and their children and their children are under the watch. The monitoring aspect of the satanic world. When you went to that Obia house to get that reed, that tabbage, that bath, that whatever. That concoction that you drank. That thing that you rubbed on. That thing that you pinned on. That thing that you took home and buried under the step at the back of the yard. That thing that you put in the bottle and hid it under the bed. That thing that you got under that tree that you dug. That spirit is watching you to make sure that you keep the covenant. And that altar that you made the covenant on is speaking to make sure that everything you say, you stay within the, the parameters of that. Which means if you say from now on we are going to get rich but nobody in the family will get married. You could be Miss Universe. Men will date you and drop you. Date you and drop you. Date you and drop you. Nobody will marry you because that altar is speaking to make sure that you are single for the rest of your life. And so is your daughter and her daughter and her daughter and her daughter. It is not a casual thing to go to an Obia house, a voodoo house, a native doctor's house, a palm reader's house, a, 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 a crystal ball reader's house. It is not a small thing to go invoking ancestral spirits. It is not a small thing to pour libation to your ancestors. It is not a small thing. You're inviting demonic agencies to come in your family for 400 years. That's what you're doing. This is not the regular Sunday morning church type service where you know you just go there to be happy, clappy and stuff. I'm digging deep tonight. And that's why I shout at people sometimes to get them angry so that they, they're angered they'll make two decisions i'm not going to listen to this guy i don't like him or i'm going to swallow my pride 
I'm going to listen to what this joker has to say because something that he says might give me some deliverance and freedom. You have either one of the two choices. And I try to be as difficult as possible when I start a message to separate the sheep from the goat. I don't have time with petty people who don't want to go nowhere. I want to waste your time with endless questions. 795 questions, but they have no intention of living even one of the answers. Stop wasting people's time. I get very suspicious with people who ask 400 questions. I know they don't intend to do anything. You just want to waste your time and pretend like they're interested. Don't waste people's time. When you go to these houses, a spirit goes with you when you leave. And they monitor you from then on to make sure that you keep the promise that you made. They monitor you. I will come unto thee and bless thee. So Satan on the other side will say, I will come unto thee and curse thee. And if thou shalt make me an altar of stone, if you're not making this altar of mud, but you're making this altar of stone, you shall not build of it with hewn stone. Don't go and cut the stone and then make an altar with that. I don't want any stone that was made by the hands of man. I want a stone that was made by me, God, by nature, by the rough waters, knocking stones together and, and creating them in that way. I don't want you to take off a piece of the stone, set it in such a way that it can be suitable for an altar, but I don't want you to break it into pieces to make it fit what you're trying to do. I want natural stones. Man's hand must not be involved in making this altar, in getting the stones in shape. You can build the altar, but you are not to break the stones into pieces to fit them into the way you want them to fit. Whatever size the stone is, make it work. Don't alter the size of the stone. I don't want your hand involved. It's amazing when God wants an offering and when God wants an altar to be built, he's very specific in what he wants. People say, you know, I can give God what I want. God understands. You try with that foolishness. That's why your life is so far back because you, you do whatever the hell you like to do and then you want God to accept your hellish offering like Cain. That's why he killed his brother because he brought whatever he wanted to bring and then got mad with God because God had respect for his brother's obedience and not for his rebellion. Today's Christians take God as if he was some little toy they can play with and they do whatever they want to do. Some of them are so glad for this COVID-19 so they don't have to be in church. So lazy that even the Zoom program that goes into their home, they're late for that too. You shall not cut the hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Any tool that you use to break the stone, you have polluted it. I don't want that stone to be on the altar. God is serious about his altar, and God is serious about his offering. He said, look, you're going to bring a sheep. Don't bring me no blind sheep. Don't bring me no sheep with sore. Don't bring me no sheep with broken leg. I want a perfect sheep, not the sorry ones that you got. I have seen some offerings in church sometimes and the bills, the $20 bill, dollar bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, they feel like a piece of cloth where people bring the oldest, raggedest bill and they put that in the offering. That is an insult. And then some people roll it up in their hand and mash it and then throw it like that. You have lost your mind. You are a disrespectful, you're not even a worshiper. You are very disrespectful to do that kind of mess. And present that to God. Go and give the, the shop man that mess. And see if he will take it. I've taken money to the bank. And the bank didn't want it. Because a piece of it was torn off. They said, sir, what happened here? And It's almost like they're arguing. I said, you're the bank. They reluctantly take it. Nobody likes to be disrespected like that. But church folks do it all the time. One offering was so horrible. I had to get the person to take a electric iron and press the thing sprinkle some water on it and press it to make it look like it had some life left in it that the money was dead 200 times dead rigor mortis was so ashamed he sucked his teeth and walked away from the money it was that raggedy and that's what people give to god i know of a sister when she's going to give to god she gets the, the 
crispest thing that just came from the mint. And it, you know it's her offering because it's always the newest, newest looking thing in the whole. You, you could get a thousand people and you could go through that offering and you can tell which one is hers. It's always the newest bill. That, and that woman is blessed beyond measure. She don't take God's thing lightly. I don't know what has happened to the church that we have become such a disgrace when it comes to the things of God. We do any old thing and talk about singing, I am a friend of God. You are not. He's not your friend. No, he's not your friend. You're not Abraham up in here with your little ragged life and you are a friend of God. No, you sing all you want. But you know that's not true and the demons know not that's not true. Mwah. Neither shall thou go up the steps unto mine altar. If you're building a step to build this altar, you're not to walk up the step. I don't want your golden bells dangling around on my altar, your nakedness showing, your wiener and two polari showing and dinging. I don't want that on my altar. I don't want no, don't even go on the first step, the first tread of the step. If it's a four-step altar, you build it, build the steps, but don't walk upon the steps. I don't want your feet to touch the steps. What a meticulous way God wants the thing done. There is order in doing things for God. There is order. In a disorderly society, people take it as persecution when you tell them that God wants order. Neither shall thou go upon the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. I don't want the rocks to see your privates. Rocks can see? Yes. Rocks can talk? Yes. They have a voice that God can hear. Jesus spoke to a tree, remember? Uh, let me continue. This scripture, you know, it's, it's rough. Sometimes you read some scripture and you explain it to people and they get mad with you like, you always with something rev. You always abusing people. You always vex. You always upset. You... Why? Because they are not accustomed to be being told the truth in their face. Uh, church has become like a play place now. People play around. Run around in church, this, that, that. When I started off in church, you could not laugh too much in the church, in the building. You couldn't eat anything in that building. You couldn't be running in and out. There was a, 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 a level of, 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 of awesome reverence in the house of God. And then as the years went, it started to dissipate, get less and less, less and less, until people just, you know, church is like any other building. They have no respect for it. Let me continue. Satan is a duplicator. He monitors us. He's a roaring lion, walking about to see who he may devour. In Genesis 15 and 8, God visits Abraham for the second time and makes a covenant with him at an altar. At that altar, his destiny is declared. I will bless you. You will live to be a ripe, you will live to a ripe old age. You will die and be buried among your fathers. Your children's children will go into captivity. They will spend 400 years. When they come out from Egypt, they will come out very wealthy. And they will be the ones that I will use to discipline the Amorites. For the cup of the Amorites is not yet full. An altar is a place where the destiny is declared, where the destiny is determined, where the destiny is predicted. That is why the demons monitor you. They want to avert your destiny. They want to cut short your destiny. They want you dead or if they can't kill you, they want to hinder the magnitude of the flow that God has for you while you're here. They hinder, they prevent you from coming to the point of your greatness that you're supposed to come to. A lot of you watching me now, you know to yourself that you are greater than this. People with less than you are doing better than you and you catching hell. People that you raised up and show how to do things, they they insulting you now. And doing your thing in front of your face while you're there in the, in the audience and doing it with impunity in front of you with no respect. Covenants are made at an altar. Destiny is declared at an altar. A promise from God is made at an altar. This spirit of the altar, God, who is a spirit, would speak from that altar. An altar now takes on a voice that can speak. 
on the behalf of the generation of that bloodline of the person that made the sacrifice at that altar and made that covenant with God. In verse 10, we read that Abraham was in a deep sleep. But his spirit is alert and understanding and forging a covenant with God. The spirit man is awake and God speaks to the destiny of Abraham and to his children, to his bloodline at that altar when that covenant was made. In the fourth generation, 400 years, God speaks to the spirit of Abraham while he is fast asleep. And the covenant ties him to that altar. Abraham is tied to that altar and to all of the promises that God made to him and to the promises that he made to God. He is tied to the altar. When your ancestors made that juju altar and did that voodoo thing with that obia stuff, they tied themselves to that altar and they tied everybody that comes out of them to that altar. That includes you with your saved self. You're tied to a satanic altar because your grandfather, your grandmother, your mother, somebody in the family, in the bloodline made a covenant with that devil and tied up everybody in the family to that altar. And even though you're saved, you're saved but tied to that altar. You will die and go to heaven and not become the person that God has destined you to be. You will always fall short of your true greatness because you are saved but limited by the power of that altar that's speaking against you. You have the nerve to talk about the blood of Jesus, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. I hear some stuff in church and most times I don't bother to say anything anymore because when you talk, oh, you think you know everything. I don't know everything, but I know some things. And the things that I know, I know it well. And over the 41 years of preaching, I've seen it work in every country that I've gone. I've seen jinxes, hexes, vexes, curses, incantations broken from half of people's lives and watch them get free and go back the next year and see them living the kind of life that they were meant to live 20 years ago. But nobody told them because nobody knew. And those that, when you know, you got to shut up because they insult you. Or you go foreign and you think because you went foreign, you can tell us what to do. We don't want to hear from you. So you got to shut your mouth and let them suffer. But this is live Facebook, so nobody can stop me from saying what I've got to say. You want to listen, you listen. You don't want to listen, you switch it off. You can block me. That's good. I block some people myself. The disrespectful ones, I block them right off. I have no time to play with that mess. God speaks to the spirit of Abraham because the flesh man is asleep. Remember, he's asleep. And the covenant ties him to the altar. His seed is tied to. His bloodline is tied to. His children, his generation of grandchildren, they're tied to. Same thing with the satanic world. You're tied to curses, sickness, diseases, infirmities, maladies, abnormalities, malfunctions, tumors, growths, blindness, swollen limbs, pain in the joints. In... Uh, In Exodus 20 and verse 24, an altar of earth shall thou make me and shall sacrifice thereon the burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, thy oxen, in all the places where I will record my name. I will come to you and I will bless you. Every place that has my name recorded as an altar, I will come to you from that place and I will bless you from that place. Blessings will run you down. That's the law of the altar. That's the principle of the altar. Look at the spiritual implication of an altar. I will come to you. And when he says I will come to you, he's not only talking to you, he's talking to your children. So long after you are dead, when your children pass by that place, the Lord will come to them and say, I made a covenant with your father. You don't know about a covenant, but I am the God of your father, Abraham. He said that to Isaac. He said that to the grandson, Jacob. And he is there to reinforce the covenant that he made. 
I will come to you. And when I come, I bring blessings. There's a spirit that A, comes to you, and B, brings blessings. Why? Because of your father, your grandfather who made a covenant with God. They will come to you, the bloodline. That means you have to be under observation to know who is in the bloodline and who is not. Your mother messed up and slept with somebody else and got a child. That child is not in the covenant. God is talking bloodline now and he knows the DNA. I will covenant at that altar and with that family, with that bloodline forever until somebody breaks the vow and decide they don't want to serve me anymore, then I will suspend the blessing that I have. I have the blessing, but I got to suspend it because y'all are not keeping your part of the bargain that I made when I made covenant with your grandfather. I want you to pay careful attention because a lot of us come from the background where our family were into juju, voodoo, and obia. They went to the palm reader, they went to the sea farm man, and you are suffering the after effects of their lawless living and you are struggling, and you are gifted, you are blessed, but on people with less ability than you, breezing through life, and you are there catching all kinds of hell. No, we're going to break that tonight, tonight. Name of Jesus. You can't say that, Rev. I just said it. We're going to break that tonight, tonight. I have been instructed by the Lord to break that thing off of people tonight. You don't have to believe me. I don't care if you believe me. I'm bold like that. I can tell you what the Lord said. You don't have to believe me, but it's going to happen anyhow. Whether you believe or not, it's going to happen. Your faith doesn't have to kick in. This is my faith at work and a word from a God that does not lie and cannot lie. It's going to break tonight. You better say the same thing and come in agreement with the brother up in here. I'm going to take my time and peel my pine. I'm going to be a bit boring tonight, but it's going to be powerful before we end here. You're going to be free from all them jinxes and, and all them hexes and all that nonsense. It's coming off tonight in the authority of Jesus' mighty name. Oh, rocker shocker. In Genesis 26 and 24, God is speaking to Isaac, the son of Abraham. And listen to God. For your father's sake, for Abraham's sake. Let me read it. Genesis 26 and 24. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee. Same thing he told Abraham. Multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servant digged a well. He knew it was altar time, time to build an altar. You got that right, June. It's, it's, it's tonight. 28th of July, 2020. It's breaking tonight. Seventh month, 28th day, year 2020. It's breaking tonight. I serve notice on all strong men of the family that, that have jurisdiction, that have legal jurisdiction because someone in the family made a covenant with you. I serve notice on you that tonight your reign of terror is over in the name of Jesus, because the power of the blessing breaks the power of the curse every single day of the week. Hey, ho, devil, you're going to have to go. 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 You're going. You're going. You're going. You're gone. You're gone. You're gone. In the name of Jesus, you're gone. Because this is not our portion, and we will not be saved and living under a curse because of association and affiliation with a bloodline. We are breaking that curse. We are taking authority over every hex, every vex, every jinx, and every spell has got to go tonight. It's leaving. It's left some of you already. Peeking through the window. Go! It's got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. Go! It's got to go. Hey, ho, devil. You got to go. For Abraham's sake, he's speaking to his son Isaac, who did not know that his father had made a covenant at that place with God. The spirit of the altar, which is the spirit of God, the altar has a spirit that's monitoring the generation of the man who made the initial covenant. The man who made the initial covenant was Abraham. And his son Isaac, by sheer coincidence, is passing through that place. And the Lord hails him up and says, Hey, Isaac, I am the spirit. 
Yahweh, the Most High, I made a covenant with your father Abraham. He's letting the son know that I am still mindful of what I said to Abraham. I don't forget. I'm watching the family to see who I will bless. And you came to mind when you came to this spot. Oh, glory a Dios, man. The spirit of the altar, which is the spirit of God, in the same token, the spirit of the altar, which is the spirit of the devil, will go on some young men and say, your father made a covenant with me. And I know you don't want to live for me. You don't want to serve me. But you're going to have to suffer under what your father made the agreement with me. You're going to have to pay the piper. Everybody pays the piper. The spirit shows up to assist him because of the covenant made with his father. The spirit of God shows up to assist Isaac. Some assistance is coming your way in the name of Jesus. God followed Isaac because of Abraham. Similarly, demons attach and bring curses to the family that is in covenant with them because of somebody in the family that made the oath. If anybody in your family went to the Juju house, the Obia house, y'all are involved in this thing and the curse is on y'all because of that. There's no ifs and buts about it. The spirit world has no neutrality. If you're not in covenant with the Lord, you are in covenant with Satan by default. That's just the way it is. Oh, Rev, I don't think so. I don't care what you think. It's, it, that's the way it is. Hey, I will bless, I will multiply thee as a result of the foundation of your father. I am here for you because of bloodline connections. The altar is speaking to the destiny of Isaac. No evil altar shall dictate my destiny. Say that with me. No evil altar shall dictate my destiny. In Isaac's case, his father's good altar was dictating his, bless his destiny. It was a destiny of blessing. It was a destiny of favor. It was a destiny of children multiplied. It was a destiny of the hand of God upon his life. Likewise, the satanic world <clears throat> speak and dictate your destiny. So I'm saying tonight as you join with me, no satanic covenant made with anyone in my bloodline shall dictate my destiny. For I'm a child of God. I divorce myself. Say it with me. I divorce myself. I delink myself. I detach myself. I disconnect myself from any covenant. Every covenant made in my bloodline. In the name of Jesus, I cut myself off and I connect myself to, to the Lord God Almighty and to the blood of Jesus' His Son. I detach myself and I connect myself. I divorce myself from satanic covenants and altars. And I connect myself and marry myself and covenant myself to the kingdom of God and to the kingdom of his dear son. Oh, rock a shocker again a third time. Hey, I'm feeling the anointing of the Lord standing up right now. Oh, oh yes, we're going to let this thing marinate tonight. I'm not going too fast. I tell you, I'm telling you again, I'm going to be a little boring, a bit boring tonight. But when we get done, this foundation will be laid so we can take off at a faster rate of speed as we go into the other services. No evil altar shall dictate my destiny. I cut myself off completely and permanently, forever, from any connections, any contact with the satanic world. Every place where people have made covenants and they have died and we didn't know about it. And due to our ignorance, we are suffering under the bondage of, of evil altars that are dictating our destiny. From here on out, this is not my portion. No evil altar shall dictate my destiny from this 28th day of July in the name of Jesus. The blood prevails. The blood of Jesus prevails. No evil altar shall dictate my destiny. I say so. I say so. I say so. With authority and with prophetic rage, I say so. No evil altar shall dictate my destiny. No evil covenant shall dictate my destiny. No evil covenant shall dictate your destiny. No evil covenant shall dictate our destiny. We are children of the Most High God. Our destiny is dictated by the covenant made by Abraham by virtue of, sal of our salvation. We are children of Abraham and Abraham's blessings are ours right now to the glory of God in the name of Jesus. Mm. In Genesis 28 and 13, we already spoke of Abraham, then we spoke of Isaac, now we're speaking of Jacob. Third generation, and God is still in the family, creating ruckus against the works of hell. 
May the Spirit of the Lord create ruckus against the works of hell. May God create upheaval against the powers of Satan, against the plans of Satan, against the schemes of Satan, against the diabolical attachments and connections of Satan. May the finger of God go to work to break the jinx, break the hex, break the vex, break the curse, break the spell in the name of Christ, his mighty son. May God arise and scatter all of the plans and schemes of the demonic world in the authority of Jesus' name and through the power of his shed blood. I soak myself and my bloodline in the blood of Jesus. I drink the blood of Jesus. Were you a vampire now, Rev? No. He that eat this cup and drink this, 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 of this cup, drink of this cup and eat of this is taking my blood on my body. Unless you eat the cup and drink, drink the cup and eat the bread, you have no part of me. They thought he was a cannibal. They never walked with him after that. I drink the blood of Jesus. Jacob is dreaming. Notice how many times God appears to them in a dream. He is talking to the spirit man, not to the flesh. Them that are in the flesh cannot please God. Jacob is dreaming and God is reaffirming the covenant he made with Isaac, his father, and with Abraham, his grandfather. God is reaffirming the covenant with Isaac. And with Grandpa Abraham, the third generation was followed by the spirit of the altar. The altar was sending out a spirit that monitored the family. It went to Isaac. Now it's gone to Jacob. He too, Jacob, is asleep. And the same covenant making God shows up because the altar is speaking for this guy, Jacob. May my altar of blessing and dedication speak for me. May the altar created by the blood of Jesus speak for me. Oh yes. The flesh is asleep but the spirit man is aware. I am the one who is accompanying you, God says. Because of Abraham and Isaac. To you and to your seed. Notice he, he never mentions you alone. Always your seed. But when Satan comes, he never mentions your seed. He mentions you alone. Because he knows how the principle operates. Once he gets you, he gets everything that's in you that comes out of your body and out of your bloodline. In Genesis 31 verses uh, 17 to 29, Laban, remember Laban? The guy worked with him for 14 years, the one daughter. He gave him the Kakai daughter and then worked him to the bone and was robbing him and changing his salary, turning his salary backward, backward taking money out of his account and all that stuff. Laban was a rascal. And there are some employers like that. Rascal. Robbing the people of their hard-earned labor. Wouldn't pay them a decent wage. And finding ways to dock their salary and to take out, take out, take out. Extract a $50 here, a $25 there. And yeah, 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 yeah. The curse of God is on you that rob the poor. You will never see your way. Never. You will always have calamity. You will always have distress. You will always have woe. For robbing the poor and the needy. The rebuke of the Lord is on everything that you gather. It shall be dispersed. And the wicked shall inherit. The things that you have wickedly obtained. No rich man that obtained his wealth. By the blood of other people. Shall sleep properly in that bed. You could buy ten beds. But you can't get sleep. The terror of God is on you. Laban is ballistic. When his son-in-law gets away with his daughter. And he's going his way with Leah and Rachel. And he comes after him. And that night when Laban is asleep, the Lord told Laban in his sleep, if you say anything good or bad, I will kill you. So when you see him, don't say anything good or bad. <laughs> Laban is a pagan. He doesn't believe in God. But even the pagans have more respect for God than some of the people that claim to believe in God. Laban doesn't cuss off Jacob when he gets to him. Like some people are prone to tell off preachers. Laban goes ballistic, but God stops him from killing Isaac. And he said, the, uh, Laban tells his son-in-law, The God of your father stopped me from speaking good or evil. He spoke to me in a dream and said, Don't you fool with my servant. Don't mess with him. Laban was convinced that God would take him out. Why? Because the altar spoke and sent a message to Laban. Don't you dare touch this man of God. You have robbed him enough and you will not rob him again. And if you mess with him, I will kill you. God is not playing. 
Genesis 35 and 1, God visits based on a covenant made at an altar. What happens at an altar? Let me give you a few things that happen at an altar. When we talk about altars, I've got about 40 some powerful points on the altar alone. We're not even talking about covenant, just the altar alone. I said 10 days, but I'm telling you, it's looking, I'm going to have to really go fast to get it done in that length of time. At an altar, spirits are summoned. The natural world calls the spirit world to come and give us some assistance. Spirits are summoned at an altar. Good spirits and evil spirits. At an altar, sacrifice is made to appease or to, to concretize the deal. At an altar, vows are agreed upon. If you do this, we will do that. If you do so, I will do so. I will give you my eldest child. You do what you want with him, but leave the rest of them for me. And as long as I serve you and give you this eldest child, you will let riches come to the family. And that eldest child is usually born a cripple or some kind of thing is wrong with them. And uh, the devil will make sure that you keep that vow that you made. At an altar, an exchange is made. The human being exchanges their gift, the blood thing that they sacrifice, or the oath from their mouth, and the spirit world deposits to them a spirit that now comes to enforce that covenant they made to make sure that riches come to them or whatever. But if they dare to not abide by that agreement, that same demon will turn around and put a whipping on that family the likes of which they have never had. Monitoring spirits are established at altars. Something is going to start watching you from that day. After that covenant is made, a spirit will start watching you. Angels or demons will start watching you. They will monitor and observe you. They will keep notes on you. They'll become like a familiar spirit with you. An assignment is made. They are assigned to altars that speak. The altars of God speak to the blessings and destiny of that family. The satanic demonic altars speak to the alteration of your destiny or the hindering of your God-given blessing. What the devil does, he derails you, A. He alters your destiny, B. He prevents you from becoming all that you can be, C. And you live a life of endless frustration, D. That's if he can't kill you first. But if he can kill you, he has gotten rid of you. He doesn't have to deal with you anymore. His first plan is to kill you. But if he can't do that, then he will monitor you, alter your destiny, hinder your God-given blessing, and cause you to live a life of frustration. No matter what you do, you can't see your way like you should see your way. And for those that do see their way, they see their way up to a certain point, and then they have to start from scratch all over again. A fire comes and burns the whole thing down and they have to start from scratch. A divorce, they lose half and they have to start from scratch. Some misfortune always happens at the time when they're rising. Almost success syndrome is on them. They never really success massive, succeed massively. They always almost got to break through. But things always go wrong at a critical time to start them back from scratch. An altar ties you to that place where the covenant is made and speaks to your destiny like it tied Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their children. The only way that covenant can be broken at that altar is when somebody breaks it in the term of the Christian, the believer, they break it by going after false gods. The minute you pick up with a false god, an idol, God stops dealing with you and all of your blessings are immediately suspended. They're not going to come to you any anymore until you reaffirm that covenant. Likewise, with the satanic world, like now some people are going to be in major trouble because they can't get to their country to do the work that they're supposed to do every year. And Satan is not an understanding master. He's going to kill off a couple of members of the family, bring tremendous sickness, burn some property down by spirits that cause fire, etc., etc. Because 
The work is supposed to be done in July and they can't fly. So they are in that other foreign country somewhere knowing they have to get to their country to reinforce that covenant every year. That's the deal that they make. And now Satan has already got one of them in the hospital over there and one of them in the hospital over here. The devil is not a good master to serve. God is good, not Satan. The covenant only breaks when someone breaks it. Your children or your grandchildren will suffer the consequences of a broken covenant with God and a broken covenant with Satan. They operate according to the law and the spirit of that altar. What you said you will do has to be done. It's a law, unalterable law. An altar ties you and your children and their children for 400 years. Your future is tied to that altar. Your seed is tied to that altar. Your destiny is tied to that altar. Whatever was agreed upon by your ancestor and by that liar Satan and the altar will dictate your destiny. You are tied up. And some of you, you know you are tied. You are like a dog on a leash. You go so far and something yanks you back. You're doing the eight-foot shuffle. You had an elephant tied in the zoo with an eight-foot chain. When that elephant was free and left in the pasture to roam as far as he could go, he would go eight feet away and then turn back. Eight feet away and then turn back. He was conditioned to only go eight feet. And some people have been conditioned to only go so far. They never had $10,000 in their bank account ever. They always go to 9900 Something goes wrong to take the money. They have never had 1000 in their account. They have never had a hundred thousand. They don't know what a hundred thousand dollar looks like. They have always been almost broke. They have always been living from paycheck to paycheck. That nonsense must stop. Tonight we're gonna stop it. No more. No more. Any limitation, any limiting power, any hedge, any fudge, any wall, any containment, any confinement, any fence, anything that has you boxed in. We're breaking out of jail tonight. We're breaking out of prison tonight. We're breaking the chains tonight. We're setting the captive free tonight. 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 Tonight is the night of freedom. Tonight is the night of deliverance. No more. Tonight we break out. Tonight we break loose. Tonight. Tonight. Tonight we set fire to the cords of the demonic world. We melt his chains with the intense heat of the Holy Ghost fire. We burn his scrolls. We dry up his rivers. We burn his altars. We destroy his covenant. We uproot his plans. We defeat his strategy in the name of Jesus through the power of shed blood. We sprinkle the blood of Jesus against the walls of confinement and containment and we break out in the name of Jesus. Every lawful captive shall be set free tonight. Every lawful captive shall be set free tonight. They got in the bondage legally by making an agreement with the satanic world but even though the agreement was lawful, every lawful captive shall be free tonight. We have been authorized and deputized to break legal contracts with the satanic world because it was made in ignorance, it was made by somebody else, and you have absolutely no right to suffer for their stupidity in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> we break the hex, the vex, the jinx, the curse, the spell, the covenant, the incantation. We break it. The juju, we break it. The voodoo, we break it. The yudu, the kudu, we break it all. We break it. We break off the stress from off of you. We break it, man. You're a child of God. You're all your children, wild, wild, wild. Nobody's serving the Lord. You're a child of God and cancer eating everybody out. You're a child of God and everybody got a swell foot or two. You're a child of God and everybody got one eye that's not seeing properly. You're a child of God. You're, you're, nobody's married in the house. All of y'all pretty and all y'all single. That devil will break off of your life tonight. We're going to wear him out like a cheap suit. And we're going to be on him like white on rice. Hey ho devil, you've got to go. Every chain must go. Every voodoo must go. All the juju must go. The native doctor's works must go. The thing buried must fly out from under the earth. In the name of Jesus, we break in ties, we break in connections, we break in contacts, we break in jinxes, we break in covenants, we break it! Every lawful captive, we are going after the legality of the satanic world, where that prosecutor of the brethren comes and accuses us before God. That is why you know it's a monitoring spirit. You can't accuse somebody if you didn't see them do something, and you couldn't see them do something if you weren't watching them. 
The devil is watching you. Has thou considered my servant Job? Yeah, but you got a hedge around him. How did Satan know that? He was watching Job. He's watching you. The altar dictates the destiny. The altar dictates the destiny. The altar dictates the destiny. Whatever your family member agreed to do at that altar, your destiny is being dictated. Let's say they agree, okay, the men in this family will not do too well in life, but you can bless the women. All the women are excelling. All the men are half big, half tail. They never get any level of success. They're all hand-to-mouth men. Your family is full of hand-to-mouth men. Raggedy men. Do nothing men. Go nowhere men. Own no property men. All of them renting some raggedy house. Name of Jesus. We break that power of no good men in the family in the name of Jesus. We break that power. I know a family of the men. The men don't work. The women mind them all the time. That devil is a liar. We break that power of Ahab men in the family in the name of Jesus. And command the spirit of Ahab to come out from the men's lives. And let them be free to be industrious men to the glory of God. I say so. I put upon them the spirit of industry in the name of Jesus. You better say the same thing. No. The altar dictates the destiny. And some altars dictate insanity. Bright, bright children and they run mad. All of them go to college and when they graduate, they run mad. So you can't have any uses to them. Because they are in the mental asylum or they come and go. Insanity. No marriage in the family. Late marriage in the family. No children in the family. No peace in the marriage. Divorce, divorce, divorce. Ten marriages in the family. Ten divorces in the family. A spirit of poverty on the family. Always hand to mouth from day one to now. Yes, divorce, poverty, almost success. Lamentation and woe, almost success syndrome. The altar legally ties the destiny. The altar <clears throat> legally hijacks the destiny of that family. What the altar says goes because an agreement was made at that altar and what that altar says goes. The altar speaks to, to the God of heaven too and says, this family cannot have success because of the covenant that they made. And because of ignorance in the family, nobody knows how to break it. And when a preacher comes along to tell them how to break it, they have an attitude. I've gone to many places and I had to leave because the people had an attitude. I was doing a, a funeral one time. I had to leave the funeral and go home because the people had an attitude. They wouldn't stop cussing at the funeral. Half of them drunk and cussing. And I'm the pastor trying to get some order to the funeral. They wouldn't stop cussing. They wouldn't stop drinking. I warned them once. I warned them twice. Then I pick up my Bible and I walk away. There was a hush in the audience. Hundreds of people said, Pastor, you can't do that. I said, it's done and I'm gone. Goodbye. And I went my way home. Didn't feel guilty at all. What a disrespectful bunch of people. That even at a funeral, they're so drunk and disorderly. That's all that family knew. How to be drunk, disorderly, and commit suicide. Those are the three things they were noted for. Drunk, disorderly, and committing suicide. God sends a, 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 a messenger to you. And that's the way you behave at a funeral? No, we're not going to have this nonsense. I'm gone. Almost success. It means you, you, you almost got the thing, but something always happens to trip you up at a significant time in your life to make you start from scratch all over again. Ah. Oh. An altar legally ties the destiny and hijacks the destiny of the family. What the altar says goes. This is the law that will run its course in your life. The law of the altar. The law of the speaking altar. When you speak, you're either activating or deactivating this law. The altar assigns spirits to you, to follow you, to monitor you. When you go to the Obia house and you go home from that Obia house, a spirit follows you from that Obia house and stays with you. And if you weren't paying attention, I will tell you what has happened from then to now. Sickness has broken out in the family. People are having funny dreams and things are touching them in the room, in the house after you went to that Obia house. 
Things are falling down by themselves in the house and nobody is there in the room, but yet things are falling down. You're seeing shadows pass you and the back of your neck feels like somebody's throwing ice water there. Oh, I can tell you all the signs. I'll give you some more in a minute. Why do I tell people all these things? I want you to know that I know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking off the side of my mouth. The satanic world will do what you ask, but they will own you and your generation. Your innocent children will be victims of satanic assassination of destiny for 400 years. <coughs> How do you know when a monitoring spirit is at work? I'm giving you some signs now. Number one, they show up in your dreams. You dream that somebody is watching you in your dream. The spirit world is trying to tell you something. Something is watching you. You notice cats and dogs are following you wherever you go. You notice birds come and fly on your fence and they wouldn't go. You throw rocks at them. They just jump and stay there watching you. The dream is revealing the spiritual aspect of your life. That you are being recorded. That spirit is there to enforce the law of the altar. Whatever agreement was made. That legal and binding agreement is operating in you even though your relative has died 30 years ago. Because the covenant is enforceable. It's legal. Somebody made an agreement with the satanic world. That makes it legal and it makes it binding. When you surrender that child for riches or good luck or wealth, that altar will speak against that child. A spirit is assigned to that child of the soul. And they will stay with that child and alter that child's destiny. And that child will never become much of anything. The altar will speak to the destiny of the bloodline. And what happens now when one person in that family gets saved? They have triggered a response from the demonic world. They have to report to Satan. Somebody in the family got saved. And so now they have to send additional spirits to monitor the one who got saved and the rest of them in the family before they get saved. The salvation of a person in the family for the first time creates a tremendous amount of upheaval and distaste in that family because Satan has to send more demons to try to keep them away from coming to Jesus. The altar speaks to the destiny of that family. Someone who gets saved has to be reported on. A report is made about your salvation. And now that you're saved, more wicked spirits are sent to monitor you. They are assigned to you to make you conform to the agreement that was made at the altar. Because now you're living for Jesus. You're altering the agreement that was made. And there are some repercussions that are going to happen. Things will get hard for you, the person who is a believer. You will know something is wrong, but you can't put your finger on it. Nobody in the family will go far, thus far and no further. It's normal in the family to succeed and then at the height of their success to fall apart and have to start all over again. Things go wrong at the worst possible moment. Proverbs 26 and 2 says it this way, A curse has a cause and a curse has a cure. A curse without cause shall not stay. Prostate cancer, elephantitis, will break out in the family. Someone in that family has done something to make an altar and a covenant with the demonic world. And usually there's a level of secrecy in the family. Nobody's talking. Somebody drank something. Somebody buried something. Somebody killed something. Somebody sprinkled the blood somewhere. You were initiated into the satanic world and hell wants to have its payment. And so it's going to break out over you. Someone has cooperated directly or indirectly. And there will be obvious negative patterns happening in the family to make you know that you're under scrutiny of the satanic world. In Isaiah 49 and verse 24 is the scripture about the lawful captive that shall be delivered. 
The lawful captive shall be delivered. What does that mean? The hold is legal over the Christian too. And you've got to break it. Break that covenant to get out. Even the believer is held captive and becomes a lawful captive of the satanic world. But tonight, you know, Isaiah 49 and 24, that you can be a believer and be legally captured by the satanic world, but the lawful captive can be delivered. You've got to say to yourself, I am that lawful captive that is being delivered right now in the name of Jesus. I'm coming out. I will not have marginal success. I will not have minuscule success. I will not have itty bitty success. I will not have pequeño success. I will have huge success, God sized success, heaven sent success to the glory of God in the name of Jesus. I refuse to be a lawful captive. Take your hands off of me. The blood of Jesus be against all lawful captivity. I will not be uh, run by lust. I will not be sleeping around with people I don't know and don't even like. But the lust is in my blood and it's boiling like a cauldron. And I got to sleep with somebody, anybody. I don't care. I just got it like that. In Judges 6 and 1 to 25, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. When you see that, it means they worship a false god, an idol. And God surrendered them to the Midianites. Remember Gideon? And when Gideon went to pray, God said, don't pray. Go check your family. When Gideon went, his father them had set up an idol altar to Baal. Gideon couldn't believe his eyes. He had to break down his father's idols. Break down the Baals. The blessing of God was suspended for that time. No blessing was coming. Say with me, my blessing shall not be suspended. My blessing shall not be suspended. My suspended blessing shall be released now and shall come to me in the authority of Jesus' name. The blessings were suspended. The Midianites had them as slaves. Gideon had to fight a battle to get out from it. You got to battle your way out of it. You got to fight your way out of it. And you've got to understand the fight has already been won by Jesus. But you got to enforce the victory that he wrought on the cross of Calvary. You can be entitled but not be experiencing the thing because of passivity. Most Christians are passive people. Talk about more than a conqueror but they don't want to fight. You can't be a conqueror far less more than a conqueror if you don't like to fight. The blessings are suspended. And God, however, in his mercy can reinstate them. And when Gideon destroyed the idol, God was going to make him a mighty man of valor and reinstate the blessings that were suspended. So now he was getting the blessing that he was supposed to get today and the blessings that were suspended that was held up. All of that was going to come at one time. I want my blessings and I want it now. I want my joy and I want it now. I want my victory and I want it now. Everything that has been suspended for years and years and years. In my one year in 2020 of July, I shall be the recipient from the hand of God is all that I was supposed to get in 2019 and 2018 and 2017 and 2016. And from the time of my birth until now, for you give us this day our daily bread. Every day that I didn't have the bread that was provided for me, I want it all good measure, pressed, shaken together and running over like Israel leaving Egypt. I want my blessing and I want it now. I want my 400 years of blessing, my 400 years of slavery that my ancestors endured. I want all of that blessings accrued and multiplied and compounded and given to me. Now I command my blessing. Blessing be thou loose. In the nombre de Jesucristo. Hey. Reinstate them, reinstate them, reinstate them, reinstate them, reinstate them, reinstate my blessing. You as a Christian, you're still playing book and key. You as a Christian with the garlic in your purse, with the clove in your shoe, with the oil of John the Conqueror. Yeah, walking backward, biting your finger and cussing. Horseshoe nail on the door, rabbit foot, maniclo broom. God is jealous. You and your Shango spirit, you and your spiritism, you and your ancestral worship, you and your pouring libation to the gods of your ancestor. God is God and he alone wants to be God. No foreign God, no alien God, no other God, he will not put up with it. Something is monitoring that diabetes in your family. Something is monitoring that blindness in your family. Something is monitoring that cancer in your family. Something is monitoring that heart attack in your family. Something is speaking to enforce that curse in your family, according to Deuteronomy 28. 
that altar, that evil altar is speaking against you all. That every time you try to break out, the altar speaks to God and says, the covenant that was made with this family does not allow for this girl to get married. She is to remain single. There's nothing God can do. Your ignorance is causing you to be a victim. Every man is the victim of his own ignorance. Every woman is the victim of her own ignorance. You shall know the truth, and the truth you know will set you free. Merely get your sister. Get her to listen now. Cabo Shai. Something is maintaining the diabetes in the family. Something is maintaining the bad sight in the family. Something is maintaining the divorce rate in the family. Something is maintaining the sore foot in the family. Something is maintaining the elephantitis in the family. Something is maintaining the inability to get married in the family. Deal with the curse or the curse will deal with you. Kill that thing or that thing will kill you. Listen to me good. I'm going to say something that's going to get you mad, but I don't care. Well, I do care, but I don't care if you're mad. Salvation does not improve the quality of your life. The application of spiritual laws does that. Don't write me no letters because I will not answer you. Salvation does not improve your quality of life. The application of spiritual laws is what does that and causes your life to improve. You've got to know and do what you know to break off these things and to get into the zone of blessing. You're in a family of drunkards and you don't like liquor, but you're still drinking. You're in a family of people dying young and you wonder if you're being monitored. You're in a family that have limited success. All y'all poor and when somebody die in the family, you're all catching hell to bury the dead. Even that you can't do. You always have small advance. No forward move that is of any significance. You're a legal captive. There are negative patterns. Your family is full of liars. All y'all got outside children. All y'all got two and three children, mother, children, father, and you're proud of it as if it's a badge of honor. All y'all whoremonger. You sleep around with everybody and their mother. Your children are, are producing, you are producing after your kind. You lawless, your children will be lawless too. No matter how you send them with us to Sunday school, they will do what they see you doing. The one hour they spend with us cannot take up for the 23 hours they spend with you. They are more exposed to your wickedness than they are exposed to our goodness for one hour in that Sunday school. And even some church don't have much goodness in them anyhow. Much to be desired with some of the stuff that goes on in the house of God. In Psalm 91, verse 1 to 3, it talks about the fowler. Who's a fowler? I'm glad you asked. Pay attention. A fowler is a skilled hunter who observes the prey for weeks and weeks and months and months. And when he decides to make his move, that prey is dead. He's going to take them out. He's going to kill them. A prowler is a monitoring spirit that watches you, observes you. To see your weaknesses. See what you're talking about. Hear what you're talking about. See what you're doing. Because they are planning an assault on you. Planning an attack on you. And when that attack comes, you're back to the drinking. You're back to the dance hall. You're back to sleeping around with people you don't even like. And you get embarrassed when you're done. And then you go do it again next month. Because that spirit has so fine-tuned you. They know what to do. What buttons to press to get you back in the mess that you thought you got free from. A fowler! A monitoring spirit watching you, observing you, cunning, crafty, skilled hunter, always on the prowl watching you. I had some demons that did not fight me when I was in my teenage years, when I was in my 20s, when I was in my 30s, when I was in my 40s. I did not get much activity from those demons. Now I'm more than 40. And some of the fights I get now, I never used to get in my younger days. The demon has made a study. They leave him, leave him. He's full of energy, full of fasting and prayer, full of tongues, full of the blood of Jesus. Leave him, leave him. We don't want to deal with him. He's too hard to handle right now. Let's wait until he simmer and get age. You know, he doesn't have this amount of energy. And then we're going to attack him slow and wear him out, wear him out, wear him out, wear him out until we bring him down. The devil has a plan and a strategy for every last one of us. 
You've got to know that that joker thinks that he's got your number and you've got to have your secret weapon ready and stash to give him a beating that he never had before. With Christ, I am more than a conqueror. The fowler watches his prey. Monitoring spirits are observing you. Stop the things you are confessing. You know, I feel lonely, you know. I feel so lonely. You're looking for trouble. And some of you are so crazy, you put it on Facebook, telling people that you're lonely. You don't do that nonsense. Stop that. The Lord rebuke you. I rebuke you. Don't put all your business out in the public square like that. Stop saying things like that. That you're frustrated and you're lonely. and Don't do that. The devil is watching you. He's going to send you some joker now to tie your life up. And you're worse now than before. You're not lonely anymore. You're miserable and getting slapped and kicked and punched and beaten up every day. Was it worth it? The fowler shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Psalm 91, 1 to 3. The fowler watches the prey. He's a skilled hunter. He observes you for, for a long period of time. In Psalm 124, verse 6 and 7, the Bible said, Your soul is escaped. As a bird from the snare of the fowler, from the trap of the fowler. Satan is always setting traps for the children of God. He's watching you and setting traps. When Jesus cast the demons out of the man, he said, look, let's go into these pigs. We are legion, we are many, we like this area. We don't want to leave this geographic location. We know how to move in this area. We know the people in this area. We know what they give. We know their weaknesses here. They like liquor. And we like to give them liquor. We don't want to move from this area to another area. We like these people that like liquor. We want to stay here and kill them out with liquor. Have you noticed that certain parts of your country, liquor is the prevailing sin? And you got 13 rum shops in one square mile. Every family has four or five drunkards. The altar is speaking. Our soul is escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowler. Say, my soul shall escape tonight. Say it. I reject. Pray along with me. I reject. I renounce. I divorce myself from evil family patterns, from local family patterns. It is not my portion. I reject it. I reject it. I break all altars, all covenant limitations. I break all limitations. I break all limitations. I bury these limitations. I bury them. I bury them. I bury them. I bury them in the name of Jesus. How do you know monitoring spirits are at work? I'm still on my subject. All right, Millie. Good. You see shadows in the house. You know a spirit is monitoring you because when you get in the house, you see shadows. There are people watching me now that have seen shadows. They know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking by faith here. I know about that personally. Seeing shadows. You see shadows. Your skin crawls. You have what is called sleep paralysis. You try to get up and can't move. Cabo shy. My soul shall escape from the fowler tonight. More energy in what you're saying. Rocker shocker. You dream that something scratch you. And when you get up the spot that the something scratch you in the dream, you have a scratch of that spot on your body. Something is touching you. Something is touching you. You're hearing steps walking in the house. Someone is calling your name. Now, this one, I've got to pause here. Because apart from the shadows and footsteps, this one used to plague me a lot. There was an aunt of mine that lived about 86 miles away from where I used to live. Nice lady. She's not involved in witchcraft in any way, shape, or form. And many times when I'm going at home, when I'm going up the stairs, I will hear her calling me from downstairs. My aunt, she is 70, 86 miles away. And I would open the door down and say, I said, when did you come? And when I asked that question, I would feel an eerie feeling 
and immediately the temperature will rise and I'll start sweating. Even my hands would start sweating and my heart would pound, pound like I just run a mile. And I could feel the eeriness in the ear. My skin, my head, my hair is growing. My skin is crawling. My eyes, my one eye would start jumping. And this, this, it's a spirit of terror would get a hold of me when I answered that call because the person was using my aunt's voice to call my name and I would answer. Anytime I answered, that's the feeling that would come over me until I learned to stop answering. Sometimes I, I, I'd ask my wife, where did my aunt come? And she said, nobody came. I said, yeah, she's downstairs. And she said, no. That's when I go open the door and get that same reaction again until after a while I stop opening any door. When I heard that voice, I wouldn't answer. I knew it was a devil following me all over the place. Satan is real. I don't care no preacher say he don't believe in Satan no more. The devil is a liar. Jesus believed in Satan. Who are you? My soul shall escape from the fowler tonight. I'm escaping tonight. I have escaped tonight. I have escaped tonight. I'm no longer a victim of monitoring spirits tonight. I'm no longer a victim of evil altars tonight. I'm no longer a victim of negative covenants tonight. I come in agreement with that preacher, whoever he is, and I want the authorized representative of God to speak the word, and I declare I'm free whom the Son set free is free indeed because Jesus is the one who will set me free, who has set me free, who has died for my freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Somebody shout unto God in your house with a voice of praise. Something is touching you sexually. Something is calling your name. A familiar voice is calling you. There are birds in your yard every time you go home. Birds are following you, flying where your car is, flying on top of the bonnet of the car, looking at you through the windshield. Birds, you shoot them, they wouldn't go. You shoot them, they wouldn't go. Cats are jumping on your car and watching you. And when they watch, you feel that eeriness come over you. You know something is causing this animal to be following you like that. I don't believe in that. Well, when the demons left the man, they said, let's go into those pigs. The devil wants to find an animal if he has to, to monitor you, to watch you, to possess something, to keep an eye on you. An altar is speaking and releasing these things to observe you. They don't want to leave you alone, but they have left you. They will leave you. You dream that you are being chased. You dream spiders. You dream cats are watching you. Pigs are watching you. Dogs are watching you. Now pray along with me. I bind every satanic surveillance system. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> oh, I felt that one. That was, yes, sir, yes, sir. He's here, y'all. He's here. Who? The deliverer. He's here. I bind every satanic surveillance system that's observing me tonight. I bind it now. I break the mirrors. I break the satanic mirrors that are observing me tonight. I bind all satanic surveillance system. I blind all satanic surveillance systems monitoring me, observing me in the name of Jesus. I blind them. They can't see me in the realm of the spirit. I declare that my name has become acid to their throat when they call my name. They will feel the acid in the spirit burning their vocal cords. They can't call my name anymore. I am off their radar. I am out from under their surveillance. They can't find me. They can't track me in the realm of the spirit. I have become, pray along, don't just sit there. I have become invisible to the kingdom of darkness in the name of Jesus. Oh yes. How do you know when you're under the observance of monitoring spirits? Things go missing and nobody stole it. A book that you are reading that's very important has gone missing. A watch has gone missing. Jewelry has gone missing. And you don't have a thief in the house. But something took it. Someone took it. Things go missing. Something is set in a very solid position on the ledge. And it seems like something pushes that thing off the ledge. Things are falling down from places they're not even supposed to move from. And yet they fall down from that spot. You're being watched. You're being watched. You're getting bitten in your dream and you get up and look at the thumb that you 
felt the bite in the dream and your tongue has a bite mark on it in the physical, in the natural, when you wake up, you're being monitored. I burn monitoring eyes with the fire of the Holy Spirit. Pray along. No monitoring spirit, no evil altar, no covenant. This is not my portion. The pots and pans move in your house. Things fall around in your house. You hear footsteps in the house. Things are coming into your room. You know when something has come into the room. You know that something has just come into the room. You feel a sense of eyes watching you from the corner of the bedroom, the bathroom. Someone is interested in you and your destiny. Something went down, and that something has got to go. No voice shall call my name. No projection to my home. I reverse every arrow of the enemy in the name of Jesus. The ditches that they have dug for me, they shall fall in it, they shall fall in it, they shall bury in it. Whosoever diggeth a pit shall fall in it, shall bury in it, shall fall in it, shall fall in it, and shall not rise again in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. God gave man dominion on this planet. No demon can come unless somebody has released them, has come into agreement with them, or somebody who is not in covenant in the family is sending these things to you. Some, and usually it's some relative or some friend who is jealous of you. Rarely is it a stranger who doesn't know you who is sending these things to you. It's always somebody that knows you. And is offended and jealous because they think that what you have, the life you have, is the life they're supposed to get. They don't know the price you paid and they don't care. They want your life. They want the good things that you've been able to accomplish. But the point is, when these things are active, somebody has released them. And if it's not you, it's somebody that you know. Look, you men that have wet dreams, you women that have wet dreams, you're having sex in your dreams, with somebody that you know, it could even be your wife that you're dreaming you have sex with. No, it's a masquerading spirit taking on the form of your wife, trying to forge a covenant with you, start something with you, or to reinstate a covenant that you have broken. Once we are done here tonight and those things are broken, you're going to find that you're going to dream people that you know, that you are married to, you're having sex with them in the dream, and you get up and you have wet the bed. It's not your wife, it's not your husband. It's a masquerading spirit. It's a monitoring spirit that is coming back, trying to reinforce the covenant that was broken. They want to come back to live with you. The devil doesn't like to lose people. You're on the attack. Look. If you ever went to a juju house, voodoo house, obia house, spirit house, palm reader house, and they gave you any concoction to drink, you're in covenant with the satanic world. If you go to those places where the people are doing their walk, and they give you food to eat from that walk, and you eat it, you're in covenant with the satanic world. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you blunt. What about all the innocent children that all the innocent children there in covenant with the devil too? Your ignorance is no excuse. My people are destroyed. Why? Lack of knowledge. Satan loves our ignorance. Our ignorance is what gives him free reign, free course to do whatever he likes. And to have a whole lot of us in covenant with him and we don't even know. Because we love to eat. Everywhere we go, we have to eat. Stop eating all over the place. I'm not asking you to be suspicious of people. I'm telling you to stop eating all over the place. When you know people can't stand you and don't like you, don't eat their food. You got countries where they're kicking people that look like you, don't buy the food from those people. Stop doing business with people that hate your race and hate your face and hate your grace and hate your space. Don't buy from them. Don't do business with them. Stay away from people that hate you. Why would you do business with somebody that can't stand you? You're looking to get poisoned. Stay away from that mess. Stop eating all over the place. Don't drink things that people gave you to drink. Drink this. Wear that. Rub that. The devil is trying to get into your bloodline to create major problems for you. Oh, glory to God.
Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. We come to God tonight as a people with understanding. We shall know the truth and the truth that we know shall set us free. We know that we have made no covenant at all with the satanic world at any time. We disconnect ourselves from all covenants made from great-great-grandfather coming down. Great-great-grandmother coming down. Mother-in-law and her generation coming down. Father-in-law and his generation coming down. The woman that I had sex with and she has a child for me from her generation, father, mother, coming down. The man that I slept with and had this child for him, from his, all of these people that you have connections and attachments to, they have spirits that monitor them. Those spirits are released to monitor you. The more you have slept around, the more devils you got on you that's monitoring you and creating all these covenantal curses upon your life and things are never going well for you. Tonight, we repent. You say, well, I don't have to repent of anything. I didn't do anything. Just shut up and repent. Swallow your pride. Take responsibility as if you did the thing. It's not going to cost you anything. Swallow your foolish pride. Your freedom is more important than your pride, your silly pride. Do you want your freedom or you want to have an argument and win an argument? I want my freedom. Hey, Kabu, Rasa Kasai, Maso Debi Kushandar. Hey man, come on Lord, come on. You know when I'm in front of an audience, I like to speak in English. So I'm having a, a word with the Lord here. Don't be, you know. <laughs> Woo -wee! Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Lord, I take responsibility as if I was the one that made this covenant. I did it. Because I thought I would get benefits from it. I did not know the spiritual implications of making covenants and raising altars to the satanic world. Now I know that Christ has come to set me free from all covenants and evil altars that are speaking against me. I disconnect myself as I repent to God Almighty for all of the connections and covenants that I have made through my words, through my behavior, through sleeping around with people I had no business sleeping with. I repent of all of my evil, my sinful ways and habits, the generational things that are lurking in my life. Lord, put the acts of God upon their necks. Let them die. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, Rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. I free myself by the blood of Jesus from all covenants. I free myself by the blood of Jesus from all bloodline covenants. I free myself by the blood of Jesus from all legal covenants. The soul of the, of the legal captive shall be delivered. And I declare tonight, I am that legal captive. I am being delivered now. In the name of Jesus, I repent of all my sinful habits and practices that violated the word of God. I humble myself before God and I admit that I have sinned and I have come short of the glory of God. I know that the wages of sin is death, but I also know that the gift of God is eternal life. I receive God's gift of eternal life. And I command that all curses, hexes, jinxes, vexes, spells, covenants, Evil altars speaking against me are now broken, broken, broken in the name of Jesus. Broken through the power of his cross. Broken through the power of his name. Broken through the power of his redemption which is in his blood. And I declare that now the blood that Jesus shed for me on the cross of Calvary, his blood shall speak for me. I declare that only the blood of Jesus speaks for me. Only the blood of Jesus speaks for me. <clears throat> Only the blood of Jesus speaks for me. I declare right now that the blood of Jesus is beginning to speak for me. I declare that the blood of Jesus will continue to speak for me. I declare that the blood of Jesus shall forever speak to me. Curses are broken, broken, broken. Covenants are broken, 
broken, broken. Altars cannot speak. I shut the mouth of every altar that is speaking against my life. And I open the mouth of every altar that speaks for me. I connect myself as a child of the kingdom. And I declare that Abraham's blessings are mine. I appropriate the blessings of Abraham to my life as a child of God in the name of Jesus. And I give God the praise right now that my name is connected to holy altars. My name is connected to the altar of sacrifice that Christ made for me. My name is connected to the blood of Jesus that will speak for me. Say that. My name is connected to the blood of Jesus that will speak for me. I break all generational curses and jinxes. I break all covenants that are wrong and evil, speaking against the people. I break them now in the name of Jesus. They shall have success. They shall have divine healing. I speak for a cure against all sicknesses, external and internal. I pour the blood of Jesus. I pour the blood of Jesus upon satanic altars. They shall disintegrate and never be able to be reassembled ever again. I burn the scrolls of the devil. I throw praise bombs into his covens and destroy them with the blood and the name of Jesus. And I declare the kingdom of God has come with power. I declare now the angelic hosts encamp round about me and they go forth to bring all of my benefits, all of my blessings that belong to me. That the angels that are ministering spirits sent to minister for me as an heir of salvation. Sent to minister to you as an heir of salvation. That all of your suspended blessings are now compounded, added, multiplied, and released to you and received by you in the name of Jesus. I connect myself. I attach myself. I connect myself to the kingdom of God. For thine alone is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now I rejoice in my freedom. I rejoice in the fact that the blood of Jesus now speaks to me. And I shout a hallelujah unto the Lord my God. And I look forward to being a recipient of every good and perfect gift that cometh down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variableness and no shadow of turning. You ask me to pray and break the curses and break the covenants tonight. And I declare that all covenants are broken. All are broken. All are broken. All agreements are broken. And every speaking altar will now shut up except for the altar that speaks for the blood of Jesus to speak on the behalf of the people. Only that one shall speak from here on out. All monitoring spirits are blinded. They can no longer see the people, can no longer track them in the realm of the spirit. Their mirrors are destroyed. Their surveillance system is broken and burned with fire. Fire upon the surveillance system of the satanic world. Their snipers cannot see the target, far less hit the target. To the glory of God, I make this declaration. It shall be as I have said. You shall have testimonies of things that did not go right for decades, shall begin to go right from today, from now. Tomorrow when your phone rings, don't be afraid. You take the phone and answer how you're doing. What has the Lord told you to do? The blessings of the Lord that make it rich, and I let no sorrow be upon you and yours. The altar with the blood of Jesus speaks with you and for you from now on. Abraham's blessings are appropriated to you, released and received by you to the glory of God, I say so. Hey, in the name of Jesus, send me a good amen right there. Send an amen. Send an amen. Say, Abraham's blessings are mine and the blood of Jesus speaks to me. We continue again. Now, tomorrow night, I have church tomorrow. I have Zoom tomorrow from 7.30 to either 8 o'clock or 8.30. So tomorrow night, we're going to start at 8.30. So get the message out. We will not start at 8 o'clock tomorrow. I have a teaching to do with my congregation here. And then when that is done, I will immediately, you know, just change the clothes and get back. So the music will play in the meantime. If you see an empty chair, don't worry. I'll be here within the five minutes range. The song takes like three to four minutes. And then I'll be back at 8.30. And we continue with this subject tomorrow night. Now that you're free, stay free. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. Keep your freedom. Maintain your freedom. The blessings and favor of the Lord be upon you as the blood of Jesus speaks in your behalf in Jesus' name. The boom is out.